Hello and welcome to Deep Dive Movie Reviews with my friend Steve Hackman and myself, James Marsh. On this episode, we are discussing the three-time Oscar nominee, Flea. Hey, but before we begin, if you haven't already subscribed to Deep Dive Movie Reviews, it'd be great if you just hit that button. It's a great way of uh, kind of expanding the visibility of the uh, YouTube channel, and uh, it doesn't cost you a dime. And if you ding that bell, you'll be notified when a new episode drops. And this is really important. That we're going to be talking spoilers here. So our review is full of, we're going to unpack Flea. We're going to discuss it from every angle. We welcome you to join in. James, tell us a little bit about Flea. Okay, so Flea premiered at the Sundance Film Festival over a year ago now, where I think it won the uh, Audience Award for the uh, Best Documentary Feature Award. Uh, but it has proved something of a kind of record-breaking sensation at the Oscars this year. Nominations are out, and it managed to score nominations in three very distinct, very different categories. It's nominated not only for Best Documentary Feature, but also as Denmark's official entry for Best International Film, yeah. and also as Best Animated Feature, where it goes up about against about half a dozen Disney movies, which normally <laughs> have that category locked down. So it's fascinating to see a film like this, so different, uh, even sort of be in consideration and in the running. And before I want to talk about the film a little bit, I do want to just talk about the Oscars a little bit because it, it is kind of crazy to see a film do so well in so uh so many sort of completely different, different fields yeah, yeah. And, and, and i wonder sorry okay, what were you gonna no, say i was just gonna say and james you when you bring up the issue of how disney and a certain type of film has so dominated the animated category are voters going to struggle to differentiate a completely different thematic film in this category uh yeah well that's the that's the big question you know when you've got films like Encanto and Luca and Raya and the Last Dragon and Mitchell and the Machines they're the other films that it's up against you know they are your, your standard animated feature fair you know they're they're child focused family friendly yeah and this is incredibly different you know this is an animated film that was that is animated primarily uh, as a way of hiding the identities of the people involved mm -hmm. Apparently, that was one of the mot key motivations for them doing it this way. I mean, in in such a way, it reminded me of the film Waltz with Bashir, mm -hmm. which was a um, <clears throat> which That's I've now name. referenced, and I can't remember the details of it. It was a, it's another animated documentary from about a decade or so ago, uh, and if I recall, it was nominated for best um, foreign language film, but then lost out to. I want to say the Japanese film Departures. I really should have probably looked this up beforehand, but I didn't. Uh, well, and it's fascinating. It's all, it was, it's all about uh, the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict. Oh, okay. And, and a survivor of it going back many, many years later. But that's all done in um, animated style as well. I think as much so that they could recreate some of these harrowing events, which is definitely the case here as well. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a very economical way of doing it as well because it's obviously much cheaper to recreate scenes of conflicts and war, uh, it, particularly in different countries and um, human trafficking and all of the rest on a, on a budget. Yes. You, if you do it animated, then you're all good. You just need the sound effects. Really. And, what's done, and what's done well here is they put in the occasional archival news footage uh, at different select spots. And it, it constantly was reminding me, this really happened. That, yeah. that was even though this is an animated film, it's easy with animation to think it's fiction because we're geared that way. Occasionally in this film, they would show archival news footage of a particular incident that was going on at the time. And it was like a it was like water being splashed in your face. Hey, don't forget this is real. This happened. Yeah, it's an incredibly effective way of doing it, you know, because the, the whole film is is animated with the exception of these sort of um, newsreel. Uh, sort of tent pegs, if you like, yeah, that kind of yeah. just keep keep grounding this story and going. Oh yeah, no, this yeah, is this... this is this is when it happened, and this is what yeah. this really happened. Yeah. And I was I was wondering right off the bat where you feel that it has the best chance of succeeding because its reach is so diversified at the Oscars this year. You know, there are three very different, very distinct categories, and my my concern for the film is that it, it's not the favorite in any of the three categories in which it's nominated. No, I, I would normally 
think this would be the kind of film that would be a slam dunk in the best international uh, film category. Mm-hmm. But it's going up against such heavy competition with Drive My Car and Worst Person in the World that although it, it in any other given year, it would deserve to be the winner. I can't mm. say that it will this year. Um, and I struggle with, I don't know if it's going to win animated either because I don't see the voters of the Academy not voting for an Encanto, which is getting huge buzz and is the kind of film that traditionally wins that category. Right. Lee doesn't normally win that category. And the th- uh, remind me, the third category is... Is documentary feature. I would probably put that as the best chance that it has. You could probably enlighten me a little better on the competition in that one. Uh, the, I think the main competition is with Questlove's movie, uh, Summer of Soul, which sort of swept the board at the um, at so, at some of the earlier award ceremonies, particularly mm-hmm. some of the do- more documentary-focused ones. Um, the only thing I would say that is working against Summer of Salt is that what are called archive documentaries, you know, which are basically just you know pieced together from archive footage, which Summer of Soul is. Okay. Uh, don't actually tend to fare very well at the uh, at the Oscars, and so I agree with you for exactly the same reasons that you stated. Yeah. That I think Flea's best shot is in the documentary feature, and I think that the other the telling sign there is that I think that the other big documentary of the year was the National Geographic film, The Rescue, all about the um, the, the the boys in Thailand who were oh, stuck yes, in yeah, the, the, the children the in Thailand who, who were stuck in, in the cave. cave. Yeah, yeah. But then that, for some reason, didn't get nominated. And so it's sort of thrown the category wide open. And I think Flea could just shoot yeah. right in there for the steal. And it could be just they want to give it something because it deserves something. And they... They might just give it to drive my car and the international feature and, mm-hmm. and a canto in the animated. Um, this might be where they say, hey, this is where we want to give it the due that it deserves. Yeah, no, I think so. I think, yeah, if I was a betting man, I'd put it on um, a documentary feature as its best shot. Um, yeah, the, the anarchist in me would love to see it win animated feature. I, yeah, I was yeah. just going to go there. Yes. Just to completely <laughs> disrupt that category, which, yes, for too long. I'm trying to think of any other example where it wasn't sort of a kid-friendly movie. I mean, I know that Hayao Miyazaki won for Spirited Away, you know, so a Japanese yeah. film won one year. But I can't think of anything really that different. I suppose no. the year Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse just a right. couple of years ago was slightly different. Yeah, and it's not to but... suggest these aren't great films. They, a lot oh, of those films are not really good films, but like you said, uh, there's a certain thematic film that has dominated that category and it, it probably deserves to be shaken up a little bit. But you know, having said that with the international film category, this used to be something that most people are unaware of that was normally mm. there'd be like one that people knew and the other four were just luckily lucky to be there. Whereas increasingly I'm seeing in that category, uh, this is becoming a real, I must watch and see the, who's going to win the international film competition because there is really strong films in that category. No, I, I agree. Absolutely. You know, that category has become sort of a, a must watch category. And, and I think the the um, nominees have got kind of better in recent years as well. I mean, yeah, like you said, this year we've got Drive My Car, we've got Worst Person in the World, we've got The Hand of God. All of them pretty uh, pretty strong films. Strong kind of films, what's the yeah. fifth? What's the fifth film in that category? Oh no, I know it's, it's like this very small. Um, I think it's from Bhutan. Yes, called right. uh, the Bhutan. Yak in the Classroom. Yeah, yeah. Which would be Which interesting. Have another, been, have yeah, another seen it. Yeah. No, it's been quite difficult to get hold of a screener for that one, but we shall see. Anyway, moving back, on. Back to uh, Flea. Yeah, back to Flea. <laughs> so Flea is, uh, in essence, it's the true story of a guy who we are introduced to as um, Amin. We're told at the beginning that some of the names and faces of people in this story are cha- have been changed to protect their identity. But he's a, a guy called Amin. He's an Afghani refugee and he's living in Denmark. He's now in his probably late 30s late 30s yeah, and so. uh he settled down uh with his boyfriend casper who is a danish guy and wants them to probably settle down and get married mm-hmm. but uh i mean is sort of troubled really by a lifetime of secrets and guilt and trauma and all the rest of it 
which the director of the uh, documentary here, Jonas Poha Rasmussen, slowly manages to eke out of Amin in a series of almost confessional interviews, which we are revealed very early on as being the first time he has ever told this story. And it's an incredibly traumatic one. You know, James, I can say, I don't think in recent memory there is a film that has made me empathize with the protagonist more than this film did. I, I felt at different times, like I was experiencing what Amid was experiencing. There was, there was one moment when they were being put in that boat with the, the uh, traffickers and they were mm. going into that hold and they were being shut in. I, I got claustrophobic. I could feel that steel door clamping down and I had to get up and walk around and just move oh, wow. a little bit because it, it so affected me. And th this movie really, uh, I, I watched it with Tammy and it, I, I'd never had that experience of what a refugee experienced from, you know, from point A. I mean, it, the whole journey is chronicled over the, the movie and there's, there's spits and spurts and there's, there's stops and there's, there's starts and there's, there's uh, frustrations and there's, there's disappointments. And there, there's so many elements in this film that just makes you realize, my God, I got to count the blessings I've got because oh, for sure. this is, it, it's, it's horrible that we live in a world in the 20th century, 21st century, where this can still occur. And I'm glad this movie was made. I think it needs to be seen by more people because it's not just a film in the traditional sense. This is something that educates us as human beings and and makes us realize we have to do things better oh we absolutely i mean it's so easy you hear so often in in sort of the the very privileged parts of the world where that we come from and that we have chosen to live yeah. uh you know just people just sort of saying oh i don't want these refugees coming to our country coming to our towns you know taking our jobs leeching on our welfare system and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, have you any idea what they have been through? You know, they are coming here to your, you know, to these developed countries to survive, you know, for the, for the, the briefest of chances that they can build some semblance of an, of a normal life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where they've obviously fleeing from great sort of persecution, normally from war, from conflict, you know, in this case, yeah, it was the Mujahideen, who snatched his father away at a young age and then yeah. Soviet invasion, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. ag again, causing a great um, humanitarian crisis. And then the journey, you know, and then uh, their only way out is to, by being exploited by human traffickers who do not care no. how, you know, whether they live or die as long as they cough up and they wring as much money as possible out of them and then send them off in the wrong direction or just, you know, su they're suffocated along the way and they end up in Russia, then they end up in, was it Norway or Estonia or, you know, and then Sweden is this such a long circuitous route just because that's the, the next step. That's the only place that they can get to. And under such traumatic conditions, it's, it's incredible. That was amazing to see that when they were fleeing Afghanistan originally, the only place they could go was Moscow because Russia was yeah. the only place. And what's interesting is, is they were part of the elite of Afghanistan. So we kind of a, a tend to associate refugees with the poor, the downtrodden. This was a family that was well-established in Afghanistan. They were in the I, I don't know how the the upper crust is in it, but you're mm. led to believe that this is this is a family of means. That was why they were able to originally leave Afghanistan uh, and yeah. use a passport and get on a plane. But the only place that they, they could go was Russia because they said that was the only place they could go in on a tourist visa. So they're in, they're on a tourist visa, which obviously expires. And then we just see how they're their misery begins because once it expires, they can't really go out on the streets much anymore. And whenever the police do end up, they, they look for these refugees because they know they can squeeze money out of them. Mm -hmm. They ask them for their papers. They know they don't have papers. They have expired papers, but they're not going to deal with having to go through all the hoops of having to deport somebody. That's too much work. 
I'm just going to put a little fear in them. I'm going to squeeze whatever money I can out of them. And then I'm going to tell them to get the hell out of here. And this is their life for, we're, we're led to believe for quite a few months, if not years. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of crazy. He said they arrived in Moscow just as the Berlin Wall was coming down and the Soviet Union was mm -hmm. breaking up. And so they said it was kind of like the Wild West out in Moscow. You know, there's a lot of crime everywhere, a lot of poverty everywhere. The police were, uh, you know, off, off the hook and arguably the worst criminals. They would get drunk and come and harass them at their house. I think, I think they were there for over a year. They said they basically spent a year hiding in their apartment watching Mexican telenovelas. So, yeah, soap operas. It was like, yes. <laughs> du dubbed into Russian. It was like the only thing that was on that was on the TV, just in the hope of you know being able to scrape together enough enough money or hearing from their relative who you know until they got he had got settled somewhere else and right. he could send for them as it were. Yeah, it's an incredible existence. And yeah, like you said, that they were a family of means. They were sort of intellectuals and educated people. Mm -hmm. And there is a temptation at the, at the other end of the refugee crisis to paint everybody with the same brush. It's like, oh, these are you know, destitute, homeless, uh, you know, working class peasants who have right. just sort of, who have had no, who have no, nothing and nowhere to go. And they're just, they're just going to be a burden wherever they appear. But it's just, they were driven out because they were a threat to the government. Yeah. yeah you know, and, and they yeah. were the day, they were dangerous I, because they were educated and eloquent and, and all the rest of it. I, I love the scenes where, um, you know, he's in Kabul as a young boy at the beginning of the film before things, the shit really hits the fan, preferably, preferably. Um, and, <laughs> anyhow, um, <laughs> and he's, he's got his uh, Walkman on and he's listening mm. to Aha, Take On Me. And in that moment, I'm thinking, see, we, we want to create the other, like we, they're, they're, they're these foreigners and they do different things in different ways. And, and I'm sure there's a measure of truth in that, but just listening to them, listening to the music, he's just a kid who likes his music, just like I've got an 11 year old who sits in his room and, and listens to his music. And, and, you know, it just really communicated to me People are alike all over. They just want a life of peace, loving their family, loving their friends. And, and you know, one, why can't we, we get that act together? But I also want to add where the animation allows for a lot of humor and a lot of, you know, when they introduce the fact that he's gay, obviously he's, mm. he, as he's conveying this to his, um, is it a counselor, a therapist, he's he's starting to acknowledge that i'm attracted to men and he's got a particular fondness for jean-claude van damme right and so when he sees the poster and it's animated of a blood sport it gives him a little wink and yeah, uh, yeah. i just genius they're in a, in and amidst this of of this very serious material james is a light whimsical humor that I really appreciated that in the midst of the darkest times, the way we can get through this is with a little humor. I mean, we're experiencing a little of that in Hong Kong right now, not to this level, but you almost have to have some, some fun with it because otherwise it just becomes unbearable. Over -bearable. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I was going to point out the exact same thing. You know, that it's one of the great strengths of the film is that it is able to uh, you know, within, within moments, the, of, of each other it can make you feel so terrified and claustrophobic that you have to get up and walk around mm -hmm. and at the same time there are these little glimpses little glimmers of just the triumph of the human spirit just yes you know the, the real the, the just the acknowledgement that we are all human and mm -hmm. our best coping mechanism is is almost invariably a sense of humor yeah absolutely. and just a little a little lightness of touch a little comedy yeah as he is sort of feeling his way, his sexual awakening, and just yeah, the fact that it's Jean Claude Van Damme at all, you know, who's this great sort of macho guy. I wonder what his response to to that would be, and just yeah, the little wink, just yeah, the little the, wink. The, the, the wink was great. It was the like, Van Damme gives yeah. him is is wonderful, and uh, you know, and you know that you know, it, outside of the animated uh, medium, you 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 can't do stuff like that. You can't articulate jokes in the same way. And so it's, it's beautiful. And it's just another way that it subverts our expectations of what an animated film should be mm -hmm. uh, in, in sort of brilliant fashion. And it does it time and again throughout the film. Yeah. And raising the LGBTQ issue uh, just takes this up a notch because we're not just dealing with a refugee situation. We're dealing with a conservative, obviously Muslim family, although the religious mm -hmm. aspect never really figures into this at all. But um, 
uh, we're, we're led to believe he, he needs to keep this to himself, you know, until, until <laughs> I just love when his brother, when he realizes he's gay and you think he, he's going to take him to a brothel to, yeah. to de-gay him. <laughs> yeah. Because exactly. he, he gives him the money. He's going to send him in. You think it's just a brothel and he goes in and it's a gay bar. There's all these guys in there. <laughs> it's like, go in and have a good time. <laughs> just <laughs> go brother, you know, <laughs> Yeah, wait, is that that's in Stockholm or something? Was that is that when they first arrived in Stockholm or is it in uh, is it in Denmark? Copenhagen I, is it? I, I, I can't remember. It, it's where the brother is. Oh uh, no no yeah no. no. Uh, I think it's Stockholm. Yeah, and then they yeah, moved on to Stockholm. Yeah, I th I think so. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's a great it's a great um, moment where again it, it completely subverts your expectations of the, yeah. of the moment. That's that's just great storytelling, right? There. Yeah, just the the way that it's done, because yeah, he he sort of says at the beginning, doesn't he, that. He didn't know he was gay because there's, there was no word for it mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. It wasn't that it was frowned upon or that it was a, it was illegal. It just it, it wasn't a thing. It was yeah. just there was just was no way of articulating that. He didn't know why that Jean Claude Van Damme poster made him all made him feel that way. Feel but it good did. inside, yeah. <laughs> and so you know, yeah. So it's great. So the, and the brothers' response to that. Uh, again, subverts our expectations, and we're just yeah. like, oh, thank goodness! You know, there is he has he's with the right people. Right. You know, he right. his family are going to support him through this, and and they they are going to understand him, and everything everything's going to be okay. That's one of the things too that's really communicated in the film is how much the family is willing to endure and to sacrifice mm. for one another. Because even the older brother, who's already made it, he's out and he's in Europe, and we learn that his girlfriend or his fiance leaves him because he's devoting too much of his savings to getting the rest of his family out. He's too single-minded on, I can't buy a house and build a life with you until I get my family out and it costs too much money. So she, she, he's willing to actually give up the relationship because he so needs to get his mother and his siblings out of, um, I was going to say Afghanistan, but they're really stuck in Russia. They're stuck in Russia. That's right. Yeah, I mean, and that's sort of the great sort of struggle that Armin is having today in the film is that you know he's it's not the fact that he's he's gay because he's you know fortunate enough to live in a country where that's yeah that's not you know, an issue that's not an issue. It's the fact that his partner is demanding the same things of him that and he's still reluctant to give it because he's so. Um, dictated by these secrets and these lies, you know, he'd been telling his whole life, he'd been telling everybody that he had no family. Right. And that they were all dead because it was to protect them. Because if, you know, he ever did get arrested or, you know, had any kind of pressure applied on him and had revealed that he had any family, then they would have pressured him to reveal who they were, where they were. And it would have just been a massive, a massive mess. And um, to live with that kind of, burden where to the point where any kind of relationship is just you know outside outside the bounds of your absolutely just functionality yeah. is uh is horrifying and uh you know so again it's reassuring to see that he does he does sort it out at the end because you, you, you're always getting that feeling that he's just going to cut his losses and just be like you know casper i'm sorry i'm not going to be able to yeah, you do this coming yeah but uh... but uh but fortunately uh no what what's interesting in the credits too what i found is and i'm wondering what the story behind this is is uh nikolai coster waldu who played jamie lannister mm. in game of thrones as well as riz ahmed uh the actor from last year's uh, academy award nominated uh sound of metal yeah both executive produced this film and i'm wondering what the connection is of these two actors to this story yeah, no, I'm not sure. I mean, I know Nikolai, Nikolai Costawaldo is Danish, right? So well, he is Danish. That's true, and it's a Danish so I imagine, so yeah. you know, he he came on board from that side of it. And I know that I mean, Riz Ahmed is obviously British, but he's um, Pakistani, mm -hmm. uh, and I know that he's just going out of his way now. Now that he has a little bit of name recognition and a little bit of clout, mm -hmm. uh, he's going out of his way to to help lift projects right. like this and help lift voices and amplify voices and all that kind of thing um i think he's the producer or even a director on one of the short films that's nominated i know he's actually listed oh, okay. so he's actually oscar nominated again this year 
for for one of the short film projects, which is a similar a similar kind of thing, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, and and this is it's a it's a great little indicator of just how projects like this get made, because I don't think they really got their hands dirty on it. Right, you know, right, it's just right. the actual construction of the film, but it's just about the financing. And I was going to say about- sometimes if you got a, you got some names, you can help lend those names to getting something done, even if you don't have to do the heavy lifting. That's what it is, I think. You know, in cases like this, it's more like I love your project. Uh, let my people help. You know, let my yeah. production company help. Uh, talk, talk to uh, you know, just joining the dots, it, making introductions, that kind of stuff. I mean. Always the, the executive producer credit is incredibly vague and all encompassing. Yeah, yeah. And it, it can it can mean literally anything yeah. from from did nothing to did a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it can, can sometimes just be a kind of residual association from a prior incarnation of a project. And you're just like, I'm not involved, but I don't want to let go completely. So I, I need my name on it somewhere. But I think in this instance, they're far more. Uh, active roles is my understanding. That would be my and it's, guess. Yeah. And it's just in, in exposure for either for financing or uh, distribution or that kind of that kind of thing. So James, as we come uh, to a close, we want to review Flea. What 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 should be our grading scale? What uh, instrument are we going to use here? Well, should we use Winking Jean Claude Van Damme posters? Whoa. <laughs> Or bingo, just, or, bingo. Or just Jean-Claude Van Damme winks. How many winks from Jean-Claude many, Van Damme? How many, how many Jean-Claude Van Damme winks <laughs> would you give? Flea. It feels almost blasphemous to give such a whimsical, lighthearted uh, grading scale to something that's a movie that's so heavy. And But I think, I think, I think it's, it works. I think, it's, I think it works. I think it, it works. works because yeah, it's it works. clearly a moment that meant so much that means so much to him you know it's, yeah. it's one of those childhood manager defining childhood mo- moments just when he realized Jean-Claude Van Damme meant something to him yeah. um that he kind of clung to and that he, he used to divide define himself when there was so little else that he could use or yeah. draw upon to define himself yeah uh, I think it's I think it's kind of quite telling even if I do say so myself yeah. but um all right. So, do you want to go first? I'll go first. This is, or, or, did I say this time? I think last episode I went first, but I'll go first again. Um, I give uh, you know, I, I this movie hit me on so many levels. I have to give it four and a half. Jean Claude Van Damme winks. It was the use of animation, the the theme, and like I said, I have never in my recent memory remember. I mean, there's movies that have. If, uh, invoked emotions in me of course this made me so empathetic for the protagonist that i felt at different times i was experiencing what they were experiencing and i realized i never want to experience this nor do i want anybody else on this planet to ever have to experience this again i give it four and a half uh this is an incredible movie and i give it unreserved recommendation excellent uh yeah pretty much on the same page as you you know, it's the kind of story that could could be, you know, so heavy and depressing, but and they yet they find some way to um, give hope and to keep the audience engaged. You know, there's a thriller element to it. There's suspense to it. There is obviously there are tough moments. There are elements of tragedy. But then, yeah, it comes through. You know, with, a, with not not with a completely resolved finale, if you like, but but just with hope that he has hopefully endured the worst things in his life that he will have to endure, and that all of that is behind him, and that he can now for, be honest and start to build again. He's opened up finally. He's faced his and, demons. Yeah, I think so, and I and I really appreciate how versatile it was in its craft as well. You know, mm-hmm. it really works as an animated film just as well as it works as a documentary, and you know, obviously it works as a foreign language film because it is one. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to give it a rock solid four Jean-Claude Van Damme winks out of five. I think it, I think it's really good. It's exce- It tells a compelling story in a really accessible and innovative way. And I think people should check it out. Fantastic. Well, until the next episode, remember, if you check in the links below, we uh, we have links to our audio podcast that uh, you can listen today's to, to today's episode on a number of audio uh, podcast platforms. James, what about uh, Yeah, that's right. 
Yes. Also, please remember to subscribe if you like what you have seen here today. Uh, ding that bell so you never miss an episode. Uh, please do check out the other videos that we have on this channel. We're you know building quite a library of reviews, and we would love to uh, hear your thoughts on our thoughts uh, in the comments below, and let us know what else you would like us to cover in the future. Until next time, goodbye. See you next episode. Bye bye.